do that. And welcome everybody. We are the Grace One Guild and I will share my screen if possible. Um, we are doing the 2023 version of the Grace Swan Guild Book Festival. We've got a dozen authors representing books that have a multiplying effect of about 100 more authors in the compendiums. But today we're going to switch gears now with my friend Chuck Metz, another erudite prof, professorial writer uh, who's a, we've done work together. And this is quite different than uh, the sessions we've done so far. We're switching to fiction, but the theme is still teaching. And Chuck has put together something that is amazing and new and different. And I want to hand over the stage to you, Chuck, on time. And please take some time to introduce the depth of yourself as we swim through this. And then we'll engage with you as we normally do. Thank you, Chuck, for being with us. Well, it is certainly my pleasure. Uh, and uh, what can I say? I had such... Chris and Louise and everybody has really hit that part of me that uh, thanks very thoughtfully. And so, um, wow. And normally I would just would bounce over the screen with this children's concept. And now I'm going, wow, children and so forth. But anyway, uh, I love uh, what we've been doing this morning. I love the depth of the discussion. I really like that uh, tactically and strategically uh, what the Guild does. I've said this so many times. I know I repeat this, but the Guild does things. And again, these folks, these authors, uh, we're doing things and making a difference. And, and I love that. Uh, I also love uh, in in that uh, the depth of the discussion does actually play into what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm not just the arcane, waffly way out there, uh, live on the edge. Uh, this does tie in, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, so I have loved the discussions this morning. They've, they've been quite good, quite good. So anyway, a little bit about me. I was, uh, thought I'd be living in academia. Uh, I'm a historian by training. Uh, science is a passion of mine. Sense making is where I live at the intersection of um, disciplines. I really like big pictures. Uh, that being said, uh, when I was setting up my PhD in uh, at that time, it was social and cultural history. Uh, life events changed things, and I found I have to um, change direction. Uh, so the other side of what I do is I like to write, and uh, with three children, and uh, hmm, not going to academia right now, uh, I drifted into communications and made that the upper half of the dyad that I had planned. Uh, uh, though I'm still a teacher at heart as well. Uh, so anyway, for the next, uh, once I left the left academia, uh, the remainder of my time was pretty much spent in communications of various sorts, uh, different venues, different uh, types of things, uh, always for other people, uh, promoting them, and looking forward to when I would have time to uh, work on projects of interest to me and 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 give my uh, meaningful part to the world if you will so anyway i semi-retired early and uh to have time which i now have and i as i say in my linkedin bio i worked on i work on projects of interest and so um i currently have an initiative uh, my current project of interest has to do with um what we've been talking about this morning, the intersection of culture and humanity uh, and why we learn, in a sense, the humanities, and we don't call them the 
cultural activities or the culture tees. We learn to be humanities in, in many cultures. And I want to talk about that intersection. I want to talk about this children's book because I have three children. And those of us that have children uh, have looked into those innocent four, five, six, seven year old eyes that are sometimes not so innocent and uh, had these hard questions about meaning and about uh, humanity and about culture. And we all have to answer them. And, and we do within the purview of the, uh, our own humanity and our own training. Uh, so I wanted to look at that. Uh, and Mid Journey and Dali, but particularly for me, Mid Journey uh, with generative imaging, uh, uh, the technology allowed me to begin to do illustrations to uh, augment the writing. And so as part of the Balance the Triangle initiative, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit, I said, why not take a stab at a children's book and try to get some complex messages as simple as possible? Uh, and that was hard, uh, very, very hard. It's been rewarding and fun, but hard. So anyway, uh, Dot is on uh, my right, your left. She snuck up on the screen. Uh, Dot's the character in the books. And you think she snuck up there, but actually Dot is everywhere and she's part of us and what we do. So she just decided to reveal herself. On the other side of me is uh, my particular favorite image in the book right now of children. And they're big, wide, innocent faces that uh, keep me... Uh, optimistic and uh, that keeps me uh, from being too pensive at times. Uh, so anyway, they're up there with us. Uh, I think what I want to do to start is I'm going to do a little book reading first, because uh, what is a book festival without a reading from an author? Now, the nice thing about fiction and a children's book is I can read that and you'll you'll listen because I'm not trying to give you data and that type of thing. So I'm going to do a little reading. Uh, and the message that I want you to see, and we're just going to read a piece of it, is if I had to distill um, the, all of this we've been talking about this morning, I thought, what can I distill it down to a child for that we can teach? And so sort of the mantra of this book uh, and this is the phraseology we're going to use throughout, says that is is better than not is. And I've been repeating that to myself now for weeks. Is is better than not is. So something happens and, uh, okay, is is better than not is. Is is better than not is. And that's what we're working on. So that's what I want you to see in this. And then we'll talk about context. But first I wanted you to hear it from... Uh, kind of the heart rather than brain cognition in. So I'm going to share my screen. And uh, oh, look, there's a kayak. My goodness. Wait for PowerPoint to launch. And then we'll go from there. If I'd have been smart, I'd had it already up on screen. But I was so enthralled with what uh, was being said, I couldn't tear myself away from it. I happen to know you're plenty smart, Chuck. You're plenty smart. All right, now. My screen share is loading, it says. Are you not getting it? It's not arriving yet. We are waiting for the magic of PowerPoint and that old operating system buried inside Windows mm. to do its deal. Well, if it doesn't do its deal, it's done its deal in the past. Mm -hmm. I have many alternatives. This is a good thing. It's always yeah, good I, to plan B. I like to hedge. I like to hedge bets. Mm -hmm. Always. Um, there. Can you see it yet? It's still loading, but now my PowerPoint is up. Mm -hmm. There it is. We have it. The beautiful images there. Thank you, Chuck. You have it. All right. Let me put it now on that.
Well, now you can see on the left while it's doing its loading thing, there's the cover of the uh, digital version. It's very similar in the print version. Uh, yes, and there's dot in the middle. Because uh, you have to give something for children to look at, something that they can relate to. So I'm having them relate to dot. It's called Yes for Reasons We'll Talk About. And in the middle, you see the mystery of intent and intent. Uh, and the uh, shorthand in this book is yellow is good, red is bad. Uh, so when you see yellow, that's like an is thing. Is is better than not is. Not is is red for the most part, but not all red things are bad. So intent can be good or bad. Uh, and we will talk about that if this thing loads. You're not screen sharing. Load any time. Ah, getting close, sir. This really is not an, an Atari, I promise. My computer is not. Yeah, I've been asking people what their first computers are, Chuck, and their life, and you seem to have brought yours with you. Is this a I, I was going to say, video? yes, it does seem that way. Does it not? All right. Now, last but least is there's no share, there's participant, there's display settings, and duplicate slideshow. There we go. All right. Now, my first computer, just for the heck of it, was mm -hmm. a 286 motherboard that a friend brought me from work, because I didn't have one at that time. And I put it up on four pegs, and I learned a little bit of hard hardware. And I had various things plugged into it, and it sat on my desk with no case. And it was so awesome. So very awesome. <laughs> Just the little little LEDs, right? Green ones or red ones? There must uh, have been two or three LEDs on it for the power. Yeah. And... They were red. Green had not been invented yet. Because you have to remember, I uh, am way older than most of you and saw uh, many things. Uh, the birth of the web was just amazing. I loved it. All right, we're almost there. That's good. Almost there. There we and go. See that. All right. I'm going to read. Um, you can pretend I'm your uh, eccentric grandfather sitting in a rocking chair. And I'm going to read to you a minute. So, yes, a quantum song of love. For all children everywhere who dream of better worlds. And to the child within each of us who dreams and wonder with them. Have you ever wondered how this beautiful world you live in began? Cultures around the world have tried to imagine this in many ways. In Chinese mythology, the universe was a formless, chaotic mass, or perhaps a cosmic egg, containing the principles of yin and yang. Before creation, Egyptian mythology featured Nun, the infinite chaotic waters. Greek mythology imagined chaos, a void of nothingness. The Judeo-Christian creation narrative pictured a formless earth in void and darkness. People around the world have struggled to imagine a beginning in which there was nothing. Scientists do wrestle with this. Scientists also have many different opinions. Some think the universe is made of very tiny vibrating strings. Others think quantum fields are set in motion by bits of energy. Some believe the universe is made of changes in movements, energies, and spins of tiny particles. Others think it's composed of changes in the height of tiny waves. Still others think the universe is made of entangled bits of information like computer code. It's all very mysterious. To make it easier, let's picture a violin in our minds. It has strings, and when musicians pull a bow across the strings, they vibrate and make sound. Imagine the music from that violin as a song of possibility, a song of what could be. We might think of it as a song of love and joy called Yes. And there we enter a little bit of gentle philosophy. Whatever the science, out of all the vastness of all that could be, 
something extraordinary happened. Dot came into being. Dot was the yes to existence. And we can imagine Dot singing that song. Dot was an am against not am. A yes against a no. A here against a not here. Dot was the answer to not. Setting the stage for everything, she became the foundation of everything that was and is and is still yet to be. And Dot's song of yes declares, is is better than not is. Better than not here or not there. Better than isn't or wasn't. Better than not existing. And the possibility of only emptiness. Our new dot was bursting with energy, just like you. And like you, she had the potential to become anything. So singing her song of unimaginable energy, Dot exploded with a big bang. This was the birth of the universe, where each galaxy, star, and planet results from an infinite dance between Dot and Not, between is and Not is. Then, as Dot's dance slowed, she released all her stored energy, filling the universe with a hot soup of particle dots that make up our universe today. Dot was no longer all alone. She had a family, quark dot, proton dot, neutron dot, and more. Though their names are strange, these were Dot's family, and they became her children, and they became her family, just like you have family. This explosion, expansion, took less than one second, less than the time it takes to snap your fingers. And in that exact second, Dot created four basic family rules in this baby universe for her new children. And I'll stop here a moment. We talk. Here we've introduced the current science within um, uh, quantum physics, uh, which is uh, today is leaning much more towards uh, singularities that pop out of an eternal, and this is interesting to see people, scientists, heading back towards an eternal quantum foam that has always existed and always will exist. Uh, now, all that will vary uh, and many, many things, but the point of Dot at this point is to teach a little bit about beginnings in terms of science and then let the cultures in which the parents live uh, give meaning upon that. Now, I would have never thought as a child of the 60s that science would ever come into disrepute. I have been amazed during the COVID epidemic uh, at the uh, aversion to science. Uh, it's hard for me to comprehend. So anyway, uh, Science is the background of each of the four volumes. There's four volumes in this series. And for this particular one, we used a little bit of physics. So it goes through, just to give the parent and the child something to talk about, the four fundamental forces that make up the universe. Then we talk about the oddnesses of the powers that Dot's children have. And these are the various quantum powers. Uh, and it sounds very arcane, but as we read through it, it's not so uh, strange. Uh, then I'm going to read again. I just don't want to take you through all of that. We talk a little bit about the creation of life and that life is yes, that life is good, that life is existence. And then we're saying, guess who else? You all are connected by Dot and her children. And we do the little yes thing. Uh, Dot's song of yes sings that life is better than not life. So we've taken it from is to life. And we say, you have a big and beautiful world in which to grow up and family and friends to care about. But they need special care because remember, we don't want our world to fade away to nothing. And we talk there. 
and give some examples. You can love your pets. Yes. You can be kind and caring to all the forest creatures. Yes. You can comfort a sad friend or become a friend to someone all alone. Yes. You can care for the earth and all its beauty and wonders, whether you live in the mountains or an island in the sea. You can care for the quiet and beautiful desert or the lush tropical jungle forest. You can love the still and peaceful Arctic tundra or be a caretaker on a lovely family farm. You can even care for a crowded and bustling city. And why, why, why should I care? Why should the child care? Because is is better than not is. Mountains are better than no mountains. Forests are better than no forest. Cities are better than no cities. Animals are better than no animals. And people are better than no people. I'm going to pause there. And let's go back to, yes. All right. In that, one of the things we're wanting to do is teach agency a little bit. Uh, in, in this fractured time, it's easy to feel, especially if you're relatively powerless as a child is, that I have no agency in accomplishing anything. Now, as parents, we teach two things to children, typically. Uh, we teach them how to be, be good citizens in their culture. And then we try to bring in, as we talked about, uh, certainly with Chris and Louise and earlier, uh, we bring in ethics, we bring in morality, we bring in what does it mean to be a good human? And those are the two two sides of this equation, being a good person in my culture and being a good human being. And, and we wrestle with that. And we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. So as parents, how do we, how can we uh, teach our children to prosper in our shared humanity that underlies the cultural balkanization and disconnects. We can glory in the diversity of the beauty of our cultures, and we can glory in the beauty of our humanity. And we get lost in the cultural conflict and lose the humanity. And, I, and I've heard several references to that this morning. So, Yes is the children's version of what I'm getting ready to talk about, which is balance the triangle. Yes is a sub-project of that. And basically balance the triangle is my initiative right now where I'm looking at fundamental underlying human behaviors that uh, we know are there. We don't always see them. Uh, and sometimes, and they trip us up, and and, and then we squabble about things. So, um, yes, before I leave that, there's going to be four volumes. That was the intro volume, which tees up the gentle philosophy: is is better than not is. Very few cultures will argue that not is is better than is, but you do find some nihilism lives in the world. Uh, but usually, it's to the other. It's not to us and ours. It's to the other. Uh, and if we see all ourselves as a human race uh, that is one, then that gives us the humanity upon which to uh, have the confidence and the integrity to enjoy the cultural diversity. So that's one of the things we're wrestling with. And uh, volume two, I'm working on now, it's about half done. It's, this was the easy one. Uh, volume two is going to use evolutionary psychology and talk that's the science part uh and it's going to talk about those big innocent eyes looking up at me and saying daddy why do people fight oh 
I know you guys have wrestled with that. Why do people fight? Well, it's because we're adults and we're stupid. Uh, but I've answered it as best I can. And we're going to answer that. We're going to try to give something in that volume that promotes uh, a, and I love Louise's uh, phraseology around this, wherever it comes from, that doesn't promote a toxic optimism. Uh, there's nothing Pollyannish in either Balance the Triangle or this uh, Yes Project. It's looking at complexity and uncertainty so, so that children can somehow begin to make sense within the frames of their intellectual development of the world that they find themselves in because uh, they're getting acculturated into their cultures. And, and if we go by what we see on television and so many other places, we don't like a lot of how our children are acculturated into our culture. Uh, and we have different ways of ameliorating that. But let's talk about the cake for a moment here. Uh, if we think about humans, and this is a metaphor uh, I thought might be useful. If we think of ourselves as cake, um, what do we find? Uh, we find that cake, uh, we've been around, uh, the number varies, 2 million years, 4 million years, a few hundred thousand years, uh, but our common humanity spans uh, a long, long, long period. Uh, on top of that, you have icing, which is our culture. Now, you do have cultures preceding the Neolithic Revolution, uh, so-called, uh, but they're not the cultures that won out. Uh, and they remain in various indigenous tribes and in that uh, to some degree changed, but to some degree. But if we want to look at culture in our world today, then we spring from the Neolithic Revolution, where we went from being hunter gatherers to uh, being uh, sedentary people interacting socially with strangers and with each other and communication being our bellwether of our humanity, if you will. So think about that. Culture, 12,000 years. Our common humanity is hundreds of thousands of years. Now, uh, for want of anything else, I call it the icing wars, the icing conflicts. Uh, in our world today, when we see conflict, it's geopolitical, it's economic, it is ideological. Uh, it is typically wrapped in a cultural icing. Uh, we war over many, many things. We fight over many, many things. Um, but behind it, there's a recipe. Oops, too far. There's a recipe for the cake. And uh, for now, I'm I'm using these. There's there's others. There is some confluence of a lot of these, but. Uh, there's a fellow that uh, I particularly like the way he encapsulates this called Oliver Perry, and he's done a number of studies that have to do with morality as cooperation. And uh, he posits that there's an intrinsic human morality that underlies, that is common to the human race under culture. And uh, it has uh, things like, number one, we all feel obligations to kin. We are wired to take care of our kin and our family uh, because it had a survival aspect. So uh, we are loyal, number two, to our group. Again, because it had a survival aspect. Our small tribes, our groups, uh, we are wired to be faithful to our groups. Number three, reciprocity. If I give you something, I expect something back. That seems to be cultures wide. It's done differently in different cultures, but if we can accept this, and this is something that I'm exploring in Balance the Triangle, uh, if we accept this, then okay, all human cultures have reciprocity as a means of a basic fundamental human morality. And then the next couple have to do with leaders. We expect leaders to be brave, to have fortitude, to uh, give largesse to us. Uh, then they expect back respect, obedience, and humility. Uh, those two uh, mirror uh, facets, uh, again, they looked at 60 cultures from indigenous to technological. And these are expectations that we apparently have wired within us. 
Uh, number six is fairness or impartiality, equality. And of course, if you've ever had a young child scream out, that's not fair. Well, you didn't teach it what was fair and what was not fair for the most part. <laughs> but I know that what just happened to them wasn't fair. And they might be right or wrong, but some fairness violation happened inside. And then finally, respect for property and property rights. Uh, he has, again, said, uh, Curry suggested that there is a human untold morality for the most part. Now, uh, we can kind of say that so if we want to base it, because if you have uh, cliches, cliches are usually built on an element of truth. If you have folklore and aphorisms, uh, they kind of undergird it. And if you look at these seven, they tie in to uh, how fundamental these feelings are within us. Blood is thicker than water. That's about kin. United we stand, divided we fall. One good turn deserves another. With great power comes great responsibility. Blessed are the meek. Let's meet in the middle. Possession is nine-tenths of the law. We hear those, and we automatically tend to say, yep, yep. Uh, and when those are violated, then uh, we feel threatened and we feel fear, and that's the negative aspect of emotions that helped our survival. And then we kind of fight and we do other things. Uh, so one suggestion, if you look behind a lot of culture wars, is uh, fundamental wiring within us is violated. And I did talk about this in the Uncertainty book where I teed up uh, a quick rundown through history in that chapter uh, to say that business people, when they're dealing with employees, typically find that one of these seven is violated in some fashion. And I'll be interested as I get feedback, which I haven't yet, that it wasn't violated, uh, that if you find some that aren't violated, I'll amend this. Uh, but I know in one of the jobs I left, uh, you know, one of the cliches is you don't leave a company because the company's bad necessarily. Uh, people more typically leave because their immediate manager was an idiot uh, and violated their sense of values. And I left a company because um, for reasons of that sort. But anyway, there's seven values. Uh, I don't have, uh, you'll find it in the article in the Uncertainty book, uh, Curry and his work, and, and you'll see this particular framework uh, teed up against uncertainty and against the business world. But here, I wanted to tee it up to yes. This is the background to uh, balance the triangle, that we have human values that we step upon and then we have negative reactions. Now with that is something called the mystery of intent, uh, whether it's free will philosophically, whether it's uh, any other thing we wanna call it, there's still a mystery about where does intent come from? Is it something hardwired? Is it cold? Is it mystical? Is it philosophical? Intent is kind of the joker, the wild card in the deck because it uh, changes the game. The game may be these seven rules, but intent shuffles those cards and brings about is things or not is things. And that's why it's both red and yellow in there. That's a quickie about that. Now, having said that, I want to talk just briefly about Balance the Triangle, and then yes, and I want most of this to be discussion. Uh, in Balance the Triangle, one of the things that this initiative is exploring is the famous quote, the infamous quote by E.O. Wilson, which people uh, say many, many places, uh, well, the thing that's uh, bad about people, our real problem is we have paleolithic emotions, uh, and here they're talking about negative emotions, per se, or paleolithic wiring and that's what we talk about in our hundreds of thousands of years of cake uh we have medieval institutions because they're predicated on those emotions uh and those seven common moralities and then we have this godlike technology so that we're children in a sandbox playing with a loaded gun uh we don't have the emotional and 
human development equal to our smartness. You know, we're kind of smart delinquents in some ways. Not because intrinsically we want to be uh, not is or bad, but because the seven wirings within us are so deeply wired within that they consistently uh, skew us to various behaviors. And one thing about knowing about them is if you know it, you can manage it a little bit. And if you think about the business world, it used to be very, very popular to uh, go into emotional intelligence and people would take tests and you would want to know where you are and and how to uh, manage your emotions. Well, there you're trying to manage the uh, lizard brain, the paleolithic brain part, uh, the part that uh, subverts cognition. But all right, paleolithic emotions, these include the negatives. And the two that uh, I focus on right now is fear and aggression. Tribalism, the instinct for survival, these emotions, while critical for our ancestor survival, can often be at odds with the complexities of modern society. Medieval institutions developed during eras with less complexity and slower change rates. These institutions can be rigid, slow to adapt, and fail to efficiently address the needs of a rapidly evolving global society. Uh, but even more than that, they follow old, uh, whether it's patriarchal, matriarchal, they follow our propensity to follow leaders. And that strong wiring we have to follow our leader, to be faithful to our group, to expect things from our leader, to give back what we're expected, and so forth. The seven points that I made. And then, of course, godlike technology would know what that's like. The rate of technological advancement is far outpacing the rate at which we're able to understand, ethically regulate, and integrate these technologies into society. That's the triangle. Um, E.O. You know, Wilson suggests it's out of balance. Uh, my experience in the decades I've been alive in the world suggests it's out of balance. Uh, things I hear this morning suggest some of that. Uh, so then the question becomes, because I'm a pragmatist in things, I don't like, especially as I've gotten older, I want things to be solvable and have a pragmatic answer. So what is the pragmatic answer to that? Well, all I can tell you is I don't know. But thinking about it, and you guys are thinking about it, and uh, so that's the initiative, balance the triangle. Uh, the way it relates to the future, because uh, Grace Swan Guild, we are futures oriented, is we want to talk about agency and imagination and vision. And yes, uh, agency Children feel they don't have a lot of agency because they don't have the ability to do. And, and all of childhood is this expanding of boundaries as they become more, uh, as they grow, so that they can have increasing agency. But even young children have more agency than uh, they certainly know and then we typically think about. And then imagination, because it's been well research that if you can imagine something strongly, the brain doesn't know any difference between imagination and reality. It creates the same types of uh, firing of synapses and so forth. And from that then comes vision. And are we going to be agents creating a future or are we going to um, watch the future unfold and analyze it and be its victims, if you were? So, uh, yes, part of yes is trying to take the um, complexities of balance the triangle. And since children are going to outlive me and come along, what can I leave behind that might serve to help parents or other caregivers teach a little bit about a complex subject? The book, yes, uh, the four volumes are meant to be read parent and child together. They can be read alone, but I certainly designed them. I've had feedback from some folks that have used them in that way. And so far, it seems like that's working. It's brought them into discussions about things they might not normally talk about uh, a little bit deeper. So in those teachable moments, 
it offers something that can maybe help a child to have agency to do positive is behaviors in their world that can help ameliorate uh, not is things, whether it be behaviors uh, or whatever. And that all sounds very high level, but the other three volumes, we're going to talk about that in, in just a little more detail. But the thing is, in every culture, uh, that looks different because we want our child to be a good cultural citizen. Uh, but we also want the world, we want us all to be good human citizens. And that's that's being lost right now uh, because the focus has been on culture wars and factionalization and and all the various things that complicate that. That being said, key to balance the triangle right now are these seven behaviors. Uh, the question becomes, is there validity that there is a basic human sense of quote unquote right and wrong? Uh, is there validity that there is a basic human approach to feeling violated? Uh, if there is, and if we can address those at that level, then working at a lower, more fundamental level uh, has uh, more uh, enhanced ability at the cultural level to do things. Because uh, if you start early in a problem, uh, it's multiplied the effects of the effort. So in culture wars or conflicts or whatever, you know, uh, bullies, uh, all the negative behaviors we can think of, are there principles in that person that have been violated that uh, if you look at the bell curve, and we're, we're not talking about sociopaths and psychopaths and that, we're talking about the bell curve of general human beings, what can a child do in their small world that helps them feel more like I'm doing something positive and and I'm understanding the world out there. So that's the gist of, in, in a very, very quick way, um, a lot I want to say, but I want to do it in terms of uh, discussion. So here we have, uh, we have all those innocent eyes, the children. I stare at this as I think about these things and try to frame, okay, is is better than not is. Uh, what can I tell you? What do I do? Uh, so let me tee up some discussion here, and then we can go to whatever depth we want to, because I wanted, um, and as always, the time goes so quickly. Uh, what do we want to discuss? I'm open now. I made it as simple as I know how to make it at the moment. Kick it off, Chuck. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much. Uh... Stop share. Here we go. Bang. This is a piece of brilliance, of course, and uh, the challenge that you've uh, mounted here is a is a great one to teach the children. Um, and then there's so many aspects and balance of what's going on. So to take on the, the, to start from first principles of going to the beginning. Um, that's really deep, as you know, and it's important, as you know. In your early readings to kids, and, and I can tell you're doing it yourself, what's in their reaction? I know you talked a little bit about what adult reaction is. What are the kids' reactions? Well, so what far, the questions they're asking? yes, I have not read this book to children yet because it's oh. just been done. Uh, I'm reflecting back on my discussions of the same nature with my children. Mm -hmm. That is step next. I'm going to be reading with, with this with children. I've only had it in my hands uh, three weeks. Okay. Uh, this book. So this is a, an ongoing project. I'm interested in feedback about people who do read it with their kids so that we can address weaknesses. Uh, I mean, the reviews are good from adults that we've taken complex subject 
and made it. And of course, you know, they say, if you can teach it to a child, then you know the thing. So if we can teach this to a child, then we know the thing. Uh, now, Balance the Triangle will probably be a book at some point, the adult version of yes, but really the problem, and I'm working on it, and, and you guys are working on it in your own way, uh, I don't have an answer yet. How do we do this? How do we do this? I think it can be done. It has to be done. Uh, the place we're at, again, listening to Louise and Chris and the others this morning, we recognize the place we're at is untenable. It's just not tenable. I really, uh, I mean, you know, when I uh, have shared in other venues about this, the thing about the megaphone is so true that uh, Chris said, uh, you give a megaphone to a populist and it's, it's boom, he has the audience and that. We have more complicated megaphones now with more power. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, we are having a resurgence of populism and dictators and that. And it's, if you want to say it's our fault, it's because I think right now it's this. We are not socially wired to handle social media in the way we've done it. We just can't handle it. We don't have yet the technology to appropriately handle it. And then we war among ourselves about, you know, freedom of speech and all this. But the point being, we cannot handle social media as it now exists. And while that's my opinion, that's also borne out by many studies. What's it gonna look like? Balance the Triangle initially was born in my thinking because with the metaverse and with AI, and with the technology getting even more godlike, without us being uh, agents able to handle it, it's just going to get worse. So how can we do that? And the first thing that came to mind is, okay, if these seven things happen to be wired within us, first let's become aware of it. Let's become aware of what violations look like. And let's see if the model holds or if we need to amend it. So now, whenever I find myself in conflict or I look at conflict, I go, okay, what's at issue here? Is it really cultural? Or, you know, if you want to take the liberal conservative thing, is that cultural? Well, yes, it's cultural, but what underlies it? Uh, if you look at some things, well, of course, we have uh, people with big megaphones uh, who like to be in power and like adulation, and I won't go any further. Um, but what's behind it? Uh, violation of norms. Liberals feel unfairness going on. Uh, they're worried about their children. They're worried about their groups. They're worried about these seven things at a very fundamental level. Now that's easy to say when it's fundamental, but then let's get tactical. How do we address it in specificity? So I want to see what it is, and if it, the model holds, then what happens is all of us and all of you that work in other areas, if the model is viable, it's another thing in the toolkit to where when you're doing futures work and when you're doing organizational work uh, and whatever toolkits all of us are using, then we recognize let's not get blinded by the icing on the cake. The issue here is you feel threatened and you're reacting in fear. And how can I ameliorate threat and fear? Because we are one human race. We have been for hundreds of thousands of years. And to pretend that we're disparate things mm, kind of belies that 12,000 years would do that that quickly. I just have a hard time with that. If that turns out to be true, then, you know, I always cheerfully eat crow, as I say. So as I learn things, uh, I, I like to cheerfully eat crow. But Balance the Triangle is looking at this. This is my particular initiative at the moment. Mm -hmm. The children's thing I like because it's something we leave behind with children. Now, I made the philosophy as basic as I could so that it would appeal to secular and religious uh, audiences. And people of all those stripes will see 
in that basicness reflections for the most part of what they do uh because uh uh chuck, uh, chuck. From my social... i have a question chuck oh no good i'm your, out of time in your <laughs> uh, your appreciation of history which is much deeper than mine can yeah. you imagine a world where yes would get banned yes would get banned if it was popularized and, and if it served again think of power okay and mm -hmm. if it was powerful uh and uh you had an authoritarian regime and it threatened their power then yes it would be banned yeah yeah no physics no physics no physics and anti science right the seven the seven points are the critical part of this it will be banned for those seven points of human behavior uh i use the quantum physics to mm -hmm. give the children something to hang a face on. Mm -hmm. But yes is is uh, based on those seven behaviors within mm -hmm. us. Yeah. Which are still being fleshed out in my thinking. Uh, but Perry seems to have nailed something there. Mm -hmm. At least as I deal with people, violations that I see. Uh, and you recall in the uncertainty article, I talked about violations at work leading employees to leave. Mm -hmm. and, and they were violations of what they were inside meaning you know chris talked about meaning violations of our meaning and our meaning comes from that intrinsic human that we are inside uh so it's so much to talk about that it, it takes a lot of conversation at a lot of levels but I wanted to introduce it here in the children's book because the children's book is meant to be read by adults and make them think. And then they get to tell their children. But yet I think I've made it basic enough that I'm not going to offend most people. Uh, now, some of my most conservative friends I'll offend uh, just because they have ideologies that, you know, dogmatic. This is what we do. Mm. But uh, uh, that's OK, too. Because actually, if they look within their traditions, it underlies it as well. So there may be something more inclusive, but certainly is and not is are fundamental. And then the tactical becomes a uh, diffusing threat. I bet we're out of time. Nope. I'm we got sure. time for a couple more questions. If there's any out there from the studio audience. And um, it's uh, I can see the depth in which you've designed this. This doesn't take a minute to no. put together. And I think it takes a career uh, of humanity to put together something like this. It really Thank feels you. like a pinnacle of a lot of where I know more, more of your other work. Uh, yeah. Chuck, it feels like a pinnacle. Uh, and then the segue into more depth is quite interesting. Sean? Nearly lost my beer there. Um, uh, Chuck, I uh, once again, you uh, every time I see you in a different incarnation and I, I just marvel at the expansiveness of your mind. Congrats on doing this. I When I first saw it, I'm like, oh, my God, the next book you're going to do is going to be on like this school of modern dance or something because you're such a, a renaissance man here. Um, I guess uh, as it, you're going through, first of all, the reading was amazing. I I, I have at least 300 self-help tapes the, the Guild should do that you should probably narrate as well. Um, but I love the fact that you've done this book and you have not dumbed down the conversation that oftentimes we have between adults and children. Um, I'm seeing by your nodding that was intentional. Take me through that because I think that was probably intentional versus oh, I'm going to stick it to the seven word where the wild things are and and you know go deeper than most of our conversations we might have we do a disservice to our children and i love john haven's comment about that who is a friend uh that it's not dumbed down uh and it forces the parent to think it forces us to confront it because it's easy to leave the behaviors buried inside us i mean i'm not fixed i still get mad goodness at stupid things. And then I go and I, and just, you know, okay, other questions. What was your question? <laughs> yeah. You uh, just did not dumb it down. 
I did not bring it down. Uh, yeah, you guys made me more somber in this presentation. I had a much more uh, fun presentation in mind, but now nah, to be in sync with what we've been discussing this morning, uh, you put me in in somber professorial mode. So what can it's, I say? It's a classic skill, good skill of reading your audience. Uh, Louise and Chris got us deep in a purpose, and you took your comedian thing and turned it into purpose. I love it. Jonathan. I just want to commend you, Chuck. I thought that was a fabulous discussion and a really uh, uplifting one because we, we went to a, some dark places yeah. and I think your emphasis on, you know, positivism, the is not is. The moment you said that on the prep call two days ago, I thought this is one session I really need at and, and I think also your you know the emphasis on agency is mm -hmm. such an important message because you know everything seems to be of such a scale and and where everything's global and what difference can we possibly make and and that's the road to nihilism and 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 just negativity and pass passivity and I don't really have a question other than to applaud because I thought that was, it's a wonderful message for the adults as well as the children in us. Well, I appreciate that because I knew in 45 minutes it was going to be so tough to try to frame this. But uh, yeah, we're, 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 I think you all, of course, got it. You're bright people. I, I love the guild. You know, I, I love being a part of the guild. Uh, this is what I work on on LinkedIn. This is what I'll be doing for the next year anyway. Uh, yeah. It'll take me through next fall to probably put all four volumes out. Uh, and as you guys read through it or think through this, if there's anything more fundamental I need to think about, boy, I'd appreciate that feedback because I want to hit all audiences because we're human. We're not religious. We're not secular. We're not all these cultural things, this 12,000-year-old thinnest veneer of icings. We're human. And I think uh, we come back to that again. Um, doing a, a little geek out. You mentioned at the beginning uh, part of the inspiration you're writing the book and uh, engaging using some artificial intelligence tools to d design the images. Uh, talk to me about how much you feel in control of what you're doing. Because what I saw was a highly consistent design set of images that matched your thoughts that's what i was seeing how are you feeling when you're using cold error prone artificial intelligence in what you're doing well the nice thing is yes ai is so primitive right now it's just such it's so uh distressing to use ai as it now exists because it's so primitive uh even in the wonder of what we think so you have to be a prompt master which I'm not, you are the prompt master because you've taught me so many things. Uh, but I did come down to a generalized prompt frame uh, that I would use. And uh, that would generate images of somewhat consistent look, uh, but uh, they would differ. Uh, they would differ. And I might have to go 10 or 15 times to get it. Uh, and while they do vary a little bit, I'm confident that I achieved enough of a unified look to make this volume work. Uh, and I think the next one is working. I'm right now in the middle of uh, the uh, the second volume is called pro uh, provisionally. Right now it's called Yes, Touching Dot, Touching People. And I'm working through the whole evolutionary psychology of threat and fear and how a child can manage that to claim a little more agency and, and have a little bit. I mean, Greta Thunberg was so impressive in what she did as a youngster. And she was the uh, Nordic uh, climate change person. Uh, and just watching her, and I've watched children since. And now as I'm older uh, and off the... Um, uh, climbing ladder of having to do things, I can sit back and enjoy watching children and helping children. 
Okay, we're going to be, uh, we have one, but sure, if you will make a comment, you know, it'll be short, and we're going to be uh, switching files. Chuck, thank you so much again. Go ahead, Basir. A uh, very quick uh, comment. I was going to bring up uh, Greta Thunberg, so you've read my mind check there. Uh, just, why not have a Gray Swan Guild uh, Project Stargate? We already have a lot of technologists, engineers, uh, computer scientists, and uh, you know AI, Chuck, and so many other members to embark on an AI Stargate. Over. Oh yeah. Uh, any if any. Uh help wants to come this way i love you guys i only work with one organization as i said early on and and i limit myself to grace one guild so any of you that want to work with me on this i'm all for it thank you chuck all right that's great uh, we're going to uh just stop what we're doing for a second